I was uh, sitting at my desk checking emails one day, and here comes this email from the Royal College. And I read the email, and I read the description of the award, and I thought, wow, this is Dan. I can't think of anything, anybody else I've worked with uh, over the last 20 years who fits this description. And there are many people uh, who have done wonderful humanitarian things, uh, but I couldn't uh, really envision somebody who's literally uh, donated his life's work to that cause. If I recall correctly, the, the Teasdale Cortes worked in Uganda in a very, very underserved area. And the parallels between that couple and the couple, the Punarus, was absolutely striking. It was like reading the same description of, of two different individuals. So um, it just made absolute sense. I've never known someone who embodied the principles of the award like Dan, like Dr. Punaru. It started in 1986. Um, and then over the years, after finishing my training, I had a strong desire to, to get to Africa. Didn't happen. There's always the sort of next step, which was training, fellow, residency, fellowship, um, then the job in, in, in Kingston, Ontario. But then over the years, that growing sense that I need to get back to this, and this is what I need to do. And uh, basically, it ended up all happening very quickly then, 1999, 2000 which eventually led in 2003 is when we left completely everything that we had in, in, in Canada, house, uh, job, um, everything, and basically went to, to Kenya. I guess it comes to the question of, you know, why did I go there? And uh, there was definitely a strong sense of duty, of, of the need to, to provide accessible care for children and surgery in countries where this is simply not existent. Dan made a life-changing decision to terminate his practice in Canada and move to Kenya, and it wasn't just a life-changing decision for him, but it literally changed the lives of thousands and thousands of children in Africa who had no other source of care, and who for the first time were getting care and compassion. It was all serendipitous. I wish I could say that I had this great 10-year plan and this is how it happened. None of it was like that. I basically went and I started working and I started doing surgeries and uh, the surgeries multiplied and uh, all that happened. And then we were doing many surgeries and I was feeling very good about it. And I realized, well, this is not, this is how long can I work like this and what's going to be left behind? So increasingly we started looking at, is there a way we can train others in pediatric surgery? He had been in Kenya for seven or eight years and he really developed a, uh, a training program for pediatric surgeons in an area that was devoid of any training. And his um, guiding principle is, is one, is uh, excellent patient care, but it's also um, to really um, teach the fishermen how to fish as opposed to just providing them a fish. And uh, what I mean by that is rather than go and simply care for patients, he will do that, but he's also ensuring that the people that are in that area are able to continue that care moving forward. And over the last several years, Dan has basically created this training program, and it's absolutely thriving. At the time, in the entire East Africa, there was no training program for pediatric surgery. So we started one. Um, we had a few uh, good surgeons, that young surgeons that wanted to train. We worked together with a College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa, uh, got a curriculum together, used the Royal College um, objectives and a curriculum that I or had already worked with decades before, and put a curriculum together and started training. So then we started training these, these young men and women, uh, very wonderful national Africans in pediatric surgery. And then we said, what? Now what? We give them the handshake and we say, well, all the best to you from here on. We realize we can't do that. So we decided as an organization, I am partnered with the organization is called Bethany Kids. It's a little, little NGO, faith-based organization that, uh, that provides holistic care for children with surgical problems. So we decided we're gonna go after them and we'll provide to these graduates um, an environment in which they can continue to practice in their country. So we will basically move into various countries, start little units, pediatric surgical units, around our national graduates.
he came at the age of 15 to us first with um, bladder extrophy, which is a condition where the bladder is open from birth to the outside, so the, the child basically lives in his urine. Um, we knew about the condition, we had a way to fix this. We had never seen somebody who came at 15. Interestingly, he had actually, he came to me only at the age of 18 because he was first seen by another surgeon at 15, told that the surgery is available, and then it took him another two years to actually get together the money just for transport back to come for surgical care. So that was a start, a difficult start. And I remember, I remember the day before the surgery, he was on our schedule for surgery, so we, we, uh, I, I went to see him pre-op before the surgery. And I saw this young man, uh, adolescent, and I went to shake his hand. In Kenya, everybody shakes everybody's hand. And instead, he was just a very, very withdrawn man who didn't even look me in the eyes. Very different from what I was used to. And, and I started talking to him and asking him questions. And, uh, and I asked him, so, so, so do, you, do you go to school? And he said, well, I'm in, uh, in grade two, primary grade two. And I was immediately upset, like, don't you understand? This is your ticket to life. Why didn't you progress more? You're 18 years old and you're in primary two. And uh, he uh, very, very sort of quietly answered that he was never allowed by the principal to go to school because of the smell of the urine. But in the last two years, they made an arrangement that he would actually be able to attend class watching through the window from the outside. And that's, that's how he actually got to grade two. So, um, so that's when I, I, I had a good cry and I apologize for my total insensitivity. But the story doesn't end here because the next day we did do the surgery and uh, by God's grace, the surgery went very well and, uh, and the child, the, the young man uh, became continent and uh, we fixed the, the defect. And the best part is, is six months later, him coming uh, to my clinic for the follow-up appointment. Uh, we had to pay for that appointment so he would come and he had a knapsack, a school knapsack on his back, and he was just, just, just so happy. Uh, his face was just shining, and the first thing he did when, he, when I came to him and he saw me, he actually pointed to his dry pants in such pride and, and joy. And that was, uh, that's one of those rewards which are very hard to explain, and uh, it's always been, it's always been, my greatest reward has been the smiles on the faces of the kids and of the, um, of the families uh, at the end of surgery. And there really is no paycheck, no environment, no setting here in Canada or anywhere in, in our rich northern countries that can uh, compensate for that smile. He has not just gone and provided his services, that would have been plenty, that would have been more than enough you know, because he's really made some incredible personal sacrifices, but he actually created a legacy, something that can be built on by others and something that will be, that will continue in Africa long after his career is over. How can other members of the college be part of, uh, part of this work? And my encouragement has always been, um, come and see. 